everybody, to the study session. It's October 24th, and we're just getting back from the fall break. Hope everybody had an enjoyable fall break with their friends and family. Great for the teachers are um, back for quarter number two. I can't believe how, how fast time flies. But we're, we're one fourth of the way through the school uh, schedule and school calendar. I know the break was appreciated. So today for our study session, we have Matt Backbrower from the city. Welcome. Thank you. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we'll review some policy, thanks to the hard work of our policy members and that group of board members that review policy and, and the individuals. Eric led, leads that team, and then we'll leave some time for any necessary roundtable that we have. Uh, anything else that anyone would like to add to the agenda before we turn the time over to Matt? Okay, Mr. Brower, it's all you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, members of the audience. Thank you so much for allowing me to come today. I appreciate the invitation, and I want to spend some time sharing with you some detail about Heaver's vision for its downtown area. And so I'm going to try to figure out how to work this. I'm not used to this type of computer, so bear with you for just a moment. There's the old name on it. You, uh, are you just trying to advance? Nails. Yes. You can just use, actually, you can just use the uh, arrows. Oh, as you like to work. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let me begin by saying that many of you have lived in the community for generations, and you're very much aware that Heber is seen currently as what's called a drive through People will come for maybe a tank of gas, a bag of ice, maybe hamburger, before they continue the drive through on to someplace else, whether it's Strawberry Reservoir, or the mountains, what have you. What we hope to do is to essentially change the drive through to a destination, where Heber downtown becomes a destination. And I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. So what I want to do is kind of uh, talk about the downtown historically for just a moment. I'll set the stage about what we believe to be three <coughs> events that are forthcoming that will be absolute game changers for the downtown and the community. Talk about the envisioned Central Heaver, which is the blueprint for transforming downtown into a destination. And then share with you some announcements and some unveilings that either happened or will be happening shortly. So let me begin by talking about retail sales in Heaver City. And in 1997, you can see the reddish oblong circle uh, around what's essentially Main Street. Main Street has, as you know, historically been the economic engine of the county, quite frankly, not just Heber City, but the county. This is where commerce has been, this is where employment is, this is where the bulk of our business has been, and this is where the bulk of our sales tax and property tax is generated. See Valley Hills in there? Yeah. It's under construction. Mm -hmm. So we fast forward to 2015, and you see Valley Hills is about completed, uh, completely. Um, but you notice that we start to see some retail sales taking place on the south end of town. And that new circle is, is Walmart, uh, the new uh, uh, sporting store, and the other uh, out parcels there. And so you start to see just some retail sales and transactions take place in other areas besides the downtown. 2020. Again, you're seeing more retail sales take place downtown, and the, the internet and online sales is exploding, and people are doing home occupations, doing transactions online, and the downtown is having, you know, as a percent, less and lesser uh, retail sales focus there. The reason that's important is because um, <clears throat> investment will generally follow retail sales. What this is showing you is by lot and by color, uh, which dignifies the, the time frame in which the building on each lot was built. So for example, any red square signifies a lot that has a building on it that was constructed before 1925. So red is very old. Uh, orange was built before 1949, right around World War II. Yellow is prior to 1975. And as you get to the greens, it's, it's more modern, it's, it's more um, recent. And you'll notice that most of the green is taking place on the south side of town. And now you're starting to see a lot more on the north side of town. What we're not seeing a lot of is reinvestment in the heart of downtown. 
which as you know has been the economic engine for generations. So what's the impact on the heart of the community with little economic focus? Well, the edges of town attract almost all investment because land is easier and oftentimes cheaper to develop. Main Street curates uh, as focus is turned elsewhere. Little reinvestment resulting in Main Street becoming undesirable. And the city as a whole loses its heart. Essentially, Central Hebrew declines. And of course, we want to avoid that. We want to avoid this scenario here. These are pictures of cities throughout the West where the downtowns have deteriorated, where you're seeing boarded up buildings. So let me take a few moments and set the stage. I will tell you personally, I think Heber's best stage are yet to head. I think we have more potential in the future than we've ever had before. And I also believe that there's three events, three happenings that are not only on the horizon, but within our zone of influence that will be game changers for not our downtown, but our community. I'd like to begin by sharing with you those three events. The first is the Mayflower Mountain Resort which is anticipated to open in 2024, 2025, essentially a year from right now. Mayflower is essentially a partnership between Mida, uh, Ixtel, Wasatch County, and as of August 24, 2023, Deer Valley Resort, with its parent owner being Altera. You may have seen that announcement, where Deer Valley will essentially manage all the terrain in the Ixtel, Mida area. Mayflower Resort is the newest alpine village built in North America since 1981. The last one built, ironically, was Deer Valley in the early 1980s. It will consist of a conference hotel and two luxury hotels, and as well as several other hotels. What you see going up right now is the conference hotel. You have the uh, Village Plaza, which is affectionately known as the Ski Beach, which will be eight acres or 1.8 square feet in size. It will consist of a golf academy, equestrian center, which will be on the east side of Highway 40. You need to understand that the Mayflower is just not what you see on the west side. It includes significant development on the east side of Highway 40 as well. The military runs four full-service vacation resorts around the world. Orlando, Hawaii, uh, Korea, and Germany. This will be their fifth world resort here in Wasatch County, Utah. The Mayflower Ski Terrain, as I mentioned, is folded into the Deer Valley as the 24-25 ski season. And this next factoid is very interesting. Deer Valley will gain a new port of entry off Highway 40, which will include 1,200 new parking spaces. Now imagine for a minute that you come into the Mayflower Resort to ski, you fly into Salt Lake International, you get your rental car, you hop on the freeway, and you pull into Midas parking lot without going through one traffic light. As I'm told, there's nowhere else in the United States that you can do that. Not one place in the United States. You can go from the airport to the ski resort without going underneath one traffic signal. This is truly going to be an extraordinary development. So why is this going to be a game changer? Well, <clears throat> Mida did a research, did some research, and it's, it's projecting that the tourism spend per year will be around $400 million. That's a huge number. That same analysis says that the average guest will stay between five and seven days. Five days will be spent at the resort, and two days is going to be spent exploring the area, probably Park City. And why not downtown Heber? Why not get into downtown Heber where they can spend a portion of that $400 million strengthening our community and our business base? So this is the first major changer in our community. The second one is the Heber Valley Corridor. Uh, there is currently an environmental impact statement underway. This is affectionately known as the, West, uh, the Western Corridor. We will learn what the preferred alignment will be in the winter of 24. So we are a matter of months away of knowing where the preferred alignment is going to be. Winter of 24, that's a year. It is, no, it is, it is months away. Winter of 24 is months away. It is months away. 20. January. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. gotcha. yeah, so this is again like a year. Okay. Yeah. This is the bypass you're talking about. This is the bypass. And we, we, after two or three years of intensive study, are literally months away from learning what that preferred alignment may be. Now, it's Heber City's position that construction is to commence as soon as possible. UDOT has told us that they intend to commence design once they have funding from UDOT. 
and we anticipate that construction would start within a, probably a five-year time, uh, time span. We intend to put a full court press on the legislature this year to educate them about this and ask for funding next legislative session after the alignment has been determined. So this is significant because this is essentially going to allow us to convert, uh, sorry, allow us to take a significant amount of traffic off of Main Street and put it on the bypass. I am being told by current businesses that the roadway is too, bu too busy and it's impacting businesses. People are avoiding going through the downtown, which means they're avoiding supporting the downtown businesses. And so we hope to have this built within five years, which will allow Heber City to essentially take jurisdictional control of Main Street and allow us to put wider sidewalks, landscape medians, uh, mid-block crossings, and other amenities to make this more pedestrian friendly, to make this more of a destination. So this is number two. Number three is the 2034 Olympics. I say the 2034 Olympics because the odds are heavily in favor of 2034 over the 2030. We are now the only applicant in the 2034 Olympics. The decision is on the horizon. It is likely to be determined in the early summer of 2024 who will host the 2034 Olympics. Now, recall the 2002 Winter Olympics. It was a $6 billion economic impact to the state of Utah. $6 billion. Fast forward 30 years, 32 years, that number is likely to be a much bigger number 30 years later. Heber City is discussing with the uh, organizing committee of making Heber a significant player in the Olympics, including having Heber host fan experience events in its downtown. To see if we can't get a large portion, as large as we can, of that six billion plus economic pie in Heber. So this is the third event that's going to be happening in the near future that will be a game changer for downtown Heber and our community. So let me briefly talk to you about the CRA in terms of sharing with you the boundaries. <clears throat> what you see here in yellow is essentially the CRA, the Community Investment, Investment Agency boundary. It primarily is along uh, Main Street. And you kind of see that main road running through the middle. It encompasses first east, first west. It encompasses Midway Lane, the county property around 600 west and the area around the new high school. It also incorporates the new Smiths area and a, a large area to the south of the city. Uh, the CRA is intended to generate tax increment that would be reinvested in the downtown. Heber City is looking at four interlocal agreements. We've got two completed, one between the agency and Heber City, the second between the agency and the Central Utah Water Conservancy District, and of course we hope to get two additional between the district and Wasatch County. The land area of the, the agency is, is about one-tenth of one percent of all of Wasatch County, meaning the CRA area is just under 1,000 acres, and Wasatch County has about 771,000 acres in it, so it's a very small portion of the overall county area. And I just want to share with you that currently there are over 173 active project areas <coughs> in Utah in cities, uh, American Fork, Beaver, Bluffdale, to Weber County, West Bountiful, West Jordan, and West Point. There are a lot of active project areas that are underway in Utah. So let me talk to you now about the blueprint that we've branded as Envision Central Heber. The blueprint to bring about downtown Heber from a pass-through to a place of destination. Vision Central Heber looked at three main areas. It looked at Main Street, obviously the artery of our community. It looked at the central neighborhoods located to the west and the east of Main Street. And it looked at what we affectionately call our recreation and tourism district along 600 West and, and, Main, and Midway Lane. This area also incorporates the area in which the new high school is being built. These were the three study areas of Envision Central Heber. The reasons why we engaged in this year-long initiative was for two decisive outcomes. The first was to develop a broadly supported long-term vision and plan with enough detail to implement supportive policy and investments. And number two, 
is to make sure Hever keeps its heart, to make sure that downtown remains the heart of our community, and a strong heart at that. I want to emphasize that this isn't, Envision Central Hever is not Matt Brower's plan. It is not the Hever City Council's plan. It is the community's plan. We had hundreds of citizens involved in this initiative. We had six stakeholder meetings, six public meetings, six steering committee meetings. We had two majors that were sent to every household and business to the study area. We emailed invitations to every household and business in the study area. We had invitations hand delivered by city staff to all the Main Street businesses. We had 276 survey responses, 1,100 unique visitors to our website, 3,200 page views, 300 social media post interactions, and nearly 1,500 hours of focus. So this was a significant investment of time to make sure that this vision encompassed the community's input. Envision Central Heber had 10 recommendations. I've highlighted just a handful of them. I'm going to read through quickly. Uh, number two is to create a walkable, bikeable central city with safe and pleasant streets. We heard this time and time again that we want a walkable community. Downtown, as you know, has been emphasizing the automobile now for over 100 years. And the community said it's, it's time for now emphasizing the pedestrian. Number four is to create increased living and working opportunities in the Main Street area for economic resilience and to better support uses like shopping, dining, gathering, and entertainment. What this means essentially is people want a community living room. They're, we're in a world of third places. We have a place where we go home, we have a place where we work, and now people are looking for a place to go do something, to go hang out. And what we hope to do is create a community living room in the downtown where people can go and hang out. And when your family and friends visit, where you take them, you take them downtown because it's just a cool place to hang out. Number five is to activate and connect public spaces on Main Street, including Hebrew City Park, Civic Center Block, and the Public Safety Block. I'm going to show you some renderings here in just a moment of this. The, the planners have come up with some really innovative designs for pedestrian areas. Number six is to enliven the streets in Hebrew's Main Street area with features that provide interest and comfort and encourage repeat visits. Seven, is create a new recreation lifestyle gateway on the west side of town that supports existing and new recreation, tourism, and outdoor oriented pursuits. What's interesting is that the west side of town contains Heber Valley Railroad, which happens to be the number one tourist destination of Wasatch County. And yet you drive out there, and what's there? Nothing. There's no retail, there's no dining, there's no uh, boutique hotels, but there's nothing. Cool. And that is excellent because between your school and MTAC, it's over a $200 million investment, and we believe that private dollars are going to follow. And we believe that you're going to see retail, and you're going to see dining, and you might see a boutique hotel. We're talking with the Heber Valley Railroad right now about moving the railroad station from the west side of the tracks to the east side, so it's visible, and to make a stage area where they can have concerts and, and gathering places and places of interest. So when people go there, they don't just leave afterwards, they stay there and they hang out and they spend money. And lastly is provide a small neighborhood dining shopping area near the train station, this is what I just talked about, to provide amenities adjacent to tourism and sporting events. <coughs> so this is some of the imagery that we came up with that was based upon community input. This picture is taken by a drone that is stationed right over the main city park. You see the Main Street on your right, you see 100 West on your left, and you're looking due north. You're looking due north about two blocks. And so what we envisioned with the input of the community is what if it looked like this? And what if we had a pedestrian alley that went from 200 South up to Center Street that focused on dining and retail? What if this was our Pearl Street? If you've been to Boulder and been on Pearl Street, you know what I'm talking about. What if this was our Pearl Street? And what if we had dining and shopping and outdoor activities here in our community? And what if we had more mixed use in the downtown so that those that live there can also support the retail and commercial that's going on there? This is really focusing in on the pedestrian plaza that would again go from 200 South up to Center Street. This is showing you that we could have some farmer's market, we could have some food trucks, we'd have hopefully fire pits, a lot of outdoor dining space. 
to really create a wonderful place where you'd want to go again and again and again and to bring your family members when they came and visited. So now let's look at the Tabernacle Square lot. You can see the main Tabernacle building there. That's Main Street there on the lower, co lower corner. You have the County Admin building there on the corner as well. And we are in conversations with the county to purchase the property and maybe transform it into this. A plaza area with maybe a conference area where people can hold conferences, reunions, gatherings, uh, maybe have a water feature. Uh, maybe allow this to serve as the northern anchor between the southern anchor and the pedestrian plaza which I just talked about. What if? Imagine this in 2050. Notice Main Street. Landscape medians. Mid-block crossings. Wider sidewalks. Parallel parking on the side streets. Open plaza that, that, that really encourages gathering and, and, and interaction with your community members. We have also taken the liberty to begin planning the Main Street Park. And what we intend to do here is to program the park at least 250 days a year. Why? We believe that retail will follow the program. And this is based upon numerous cities that we visited and studied. Let me orient you here. Main Street's on the bottom. First West is on the top. 200 South is there on your right. We have the pedestrian walkway, uh, which I talked about briefly. And we have a new band shell that's going to be located in 200 South, but facing due South. And so the, the notion- The sign that's announcing that is up, right? It is up. Yeah, it is up. And I'm going to make an announcement here in just a moment about that band shell. Okay. And so what we're hoping to do, as I mentioned, is to program this park 250 days a year. So this becomes essentially, um, a, again, an extension of Pearl Street, Mallory Square. Uh, this is uh, Grand Square in, in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. You can think of many communities that have something similar to this. Codwell, Idaho, uh, whose similar area has transformed their downtown. What we hope to do is to close 200 South, other than a one-way street that would come off 40 to 100 West. That band shell would have two faces. It'd have the main face into the park, and it'd have a smaller face that would point into the pedestrian plaza. So you could have concerts facing either into the park or into the pedestrian plaza. 200 South could be closed at any time for the main events. We're looking at having on 200 South various booths that people could have incubators to do art, to do um, pottery wheels, what have you. So you could go watch them create it and they'd have a chance to sell it right there. So it becomes an incubator of sorts for the art community. We're looking at maybe having a splash pad and an ice rink around the splash pad so you can program it year round. The building on the left hand side is, is potentially a, a, a building where we would have a rubber tired train that would take people from that building up to the railroad. Why not have their visits start in downtown, buy their tickets here, we take them up to the train where they ride the train and then maybe bring them back down to the area that's got all the programming into it. It's an idea that we're playing with. It's simply just a concept. I show this to you because on 200 South, we intend to uh, use a play out of Fort Collins, Colorado Playbook. This is near their uh, Old Town Square. This is a curbless street. It is made out of pavers. And we intend to do the same with 200 South. We intend to use pavers. We intend to use curbless streets so that it becomes more of a gathering place, a place that we can use for large events and small events alike, and it can be programmed year-round. So let me share with you some announcements and unveilings to, share, to tell you that this is not pie in the sky. We are taking action on this, and we are moving the ball forward. We are moving the needle as we speak. The first is coming to spring 24 is that band shell. That band shell will go into construction probably in March or April of next year. We received a 600000 grant from the state of Utah, and we were going to match that with $400,000 to get this project underway. We have some additional renderings of it. This is the south facing of the band that's looking due south. Uh, we're looking at uh, placing half its footprint into 200 south and another portion into the park area. And this is showing what it might look like when we have a plaza area built in the front of it. Also coming, uh, this actually should say spring 24, I made a little error there, 
is we have a water feature that is currently under construction at City Hall. Again, this is the northern part of our project area. What's interesting here is we are now getting the interest of funding partners. CAM has come forward and said we'll put 50,000 in. The Heber Valley Tours Economic Development said they're going to put 50,000 in. So with the city's 100,000, we have a water feature that's going to be put there. Why there? Because we put a food truck court on the north side of City Hall, and on the weekends, if you drive past here, you'll see 50 to 70 people picnicking out and around this building. And so we thought, why not add an amenity here and help reinforce this northern part of our pedestrian area? And again, this is under construction, and will be done in the spring of 24. Another project that is complete that you may have noticed is that we removed all of the Culver Head lights throughout the downtown. And what these pictures show you is their removal. What that means is that clutter, that visual clutter is gone. And we've changed out the old Acorn lights to dark sky compliant lights. So we removed the Culver Heads and we transformed the existing lights to dark sky compliant. So we've cleaned up the visual clutter, made it more dark sky compliant and hopefully a better, more attractive community to spend time in. And so as we start moving that needle, start making the investments, you might ask, well, what are your priorities? Where are we heading? And first is assembly of land. Uh, we've got to get more surface parking in the downtown. We currently have offers in to the county for purchase of their <coughs> old fire station on 100 West. They will no longer need that fire station when their new station is built on 1200 South. We also have an offer in to Heber Light Power to purchase their small administration building there off 100 West, right next to the fire station. You might be aware that Heber Light Power is also building a brand new administration building on 600 West, which will help re-energize that area. And we also have an offer into Wasatch County to purchase their administration building to make that the northern hub of our pedestrian walkway. We're also looking to activate connect public places. I mentioned to you the 200 South Plaza area. My city council has already approved the placement of the band shell in 200 South, a portion of it. That band shell is going to go into construction here in a matter of months. And of course, we're looking at activating the main city park, hoping that retail will follow that. We're also looking at enlivening Main Street in the side streets, doing various streetscape amenities. And this will take place after the bypass is built and we have some control over Main Street and are able to do some of the investments which I shared with you and talked about. This next one is pretty exciting. We are working with the County and uh, Mountainlands Association of Government on a rail trail that will bring a bike trail up Provo Canyon and terminate into what we're calling our trail depot right next to the Heber Valley Railroad. What we intend to do is make this a trail depot where you can access any trail in the county from that trail depot, giving people more reasons to come downtown, park your car, get out and walk, or get out and bike and have a lot of fun. We are also installing, as we speak, a central Heber trail that will take you from the trail depot through the east side of town, cross Highway 40, through the, sorry, from the west side of town, 40 to the east side of town, and allow you to hook into the Red Ledges Trail Network or the Coyote Canyon Trail Network. The Red Ledges main trail is being built as we speak. That is located on the south side of Eastern Bypass, which is currently under construction. We're also looking at developing a west gateway area around the railroad. I mentioned the plaza and the gathering area. We're in conversations with Mark Nielsen at the railroad to pull this off. And of course, we're also looking at providing some incentives for high quality architecture. We don't want the plain old architecture. We want architecture that's intriguing, that's exciting, that is invigorating, that people want to see and enjoy and, and experience time and time again. So, thank you. I, I've gone through my presentation. I do want to take any questions that you may have. I really appreciate the opportunity to share the vision that we are creating, that was created by the community, and really the effort that we're making to move that needle on that vision. Any questions? Thanks, Matt. That's very helpful. I haven't seen any of that before. Yeah, I'm very, very, very impressed, and, and uh, you know, I, I grew up here, and never really seen a vision for this, and this is really amazing to see. So, thank, thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome. Very welcome. It's progressive. It's, it's exciting. It, it uh, gives kind of a neat carrot for everybody to chase. Absolutely, absolutely. I have some questions. What guarantees the trucks 
Like what's, what's the guarantee to take the trucks off main onto the bypass? There's a couple strategies we intend to deploy. One is once we gain jurisdictional control, is to slow the speed down. And so from a time perspective, they'll be able to get from one side of town to the other faster using the bypass. So it's a federal highway. So no. what? Okay. No. So what, what steps do you have to take to, to gain that control? Um, what we hope to do is one of two things. When I was city manager in Santa Clara, Utah, we did a streetscape on Old Highway 91, which is also a federal highway. We were unable to gain jurisdiction of that roadway because it's really only one of two highways to get you from Southern Utah into Nevada, and they were unwilling to give that control up. But what you UDOT did is say, we will partner with you and allow you to do the streetscape. And they did the same with St. George on the boulevard. Recall about 15 years ago, they did a streetscape on that boulevard. So in those two circumstances, neither St. George nor Santa Clara were able to take over jurisdictional control, but they were able to work with UDOT to do some amazing streetscape. What we hope to do here is first request jurisdictional control. It's going to be different here because we're going to be creating a brand new bypass and the state's going to have a brand new state highway. They don't like maintaining roads. Why? It's expensive. And so they prefer to have one road maintained instead of two. So we believe there will be some incentive for them to potentially give us jurisdictional control. And if they don't, what we intend to do is work with them in the same way we did in Santa Clara, in the same way that St. George did it on the boulevard, is to partner with them to make these transformations happen. But if we gain jurisdictional control, we will have control over that speed limit. And once the bypass is created, we believe that we can convince UDOT to slow that traffic down. Does that request have to go beyond the state? Because no, a... no. UDOT's been given authority from Federal Highway Administration to make those decisions. Hey man, in the past, growing up around here again too, it always, the, the cry of the merchants on Main Street was that we, we want people driving by our businesses. Uh, we have a business off Main Street now. You know, it, what what is the feeling of the merchants of uh, hey, we, we'd rather see the traffic off this road than on this road. What what's been the feeling? So let me let me give you some data. We did a traffic study in 2019. It was a precursor study to the EIS work being done right now, and it said that right now we have over 30,000 trips per day on Main Street. We have over 6,000 trips per day on one east and 7,000 trips per day on west, on one west. By 2050, without the bypass, Main Street's gonna to go to 40,000 trips per day. And because of that volume, there's gonna be a spillover of 100 west and 100 east. So that 100 west is gonna have nearly 20,000 trips and the same as 100 east. So you're gonna have a boatload of traffic coming this way. Think of Mida. Think of all the development around the, the Jordan L Basin. Think about the North Village. Think about the sorts of development. There is a ton of development coming our way. And what I'm hearing is right now, it's too busy. There's too much traffic. And we've got to eliminate some of that traffic. We just lost a little girl, Matt, on Main Street. I didn't know that. It's time. I didn't know that. It's time we get the traffic off that road. What? No. No. Maybe we, if, if it's an accident, but you know, that's just another symptom of the, of the busyness. Mm -hmm. Our kids are getting hit. It's time. Yeah, what are the odds, what are the, have you discussed a pedestrian, building a pedestrian crossing, like a bridge? We have not considered a pedestrian crossing right. because it's a UDOT highway. We don't control it. That's why we hope to either take jurisdictional control over it or to have more influence once the bypass is built. What happens to the current businesses there with your plan? The current businesses? Yeah, the businesses that are on Main Street right now. I mean, what's, what happens to them? So we had, in, on August 16th of this year, we had a town meeting in the Avon Theater where we invited every property owner and every business owner in the downtown, and we shared them this plan in even greater detail. And I can tell you that based upon my firsthand experience of being there and being a presenter, the business community is excited about this. And they're excited about the opportunities to reprogram some of their businesses from gyms and, and low class C um, outfits to retail and commercial and some dining. They're excited because they're gonna see rents increase, they're gonna see more opportunities, they're gonna see perhaps investments increase in the downtown. The business community, based on my first-hand account, is extremely excited about all of this. So basically, some of those smaller businesses won't be able to survive there because their rent's going to increase. They won't be able to stay there. They'll well, the notion out. is that if we get the downtown destination in place, 
you're going to see a lot more customers. You're going to see a lot more transactions. You're going to see hopefully a lot more business. So those small businesses will actually be successful. What we're hoping is that we have a lot more retail. Right now, you do walk the downtown at night. There's nothing there. There's nothing open. There's no reason for you to spend any time in downtown. We hope to maybe convince some of the property owners to load the downtown <coughs> businesses that are open at night. So you can window shop and you can shop and dine and spend time with your family there so the businesses there are actually more successful in the future. So the businesses, other than the architectural help, what else, what's in it for them other than the, the town being more accessible through the CRA? Remind me if I'm a business owner and I'm in the CRA boundary, I saw the bullet point about helping with some Maybe if I have a good architectural design, you'll yep. let me build it. Expand on that. So my perspective of why this is valuable to the businesses. Yeah, why would I want to be in the CRA? Is, first of all, the CRA is going to be making strategic investments for the first time in the downtown. Now remember, it's the business community who carries the shoulder load of the tax burden of all of our organizations. And for the first time, <coughs> if we can do this, we're going to be reinvesting in those organizations that share that load. And what we're telling them right now as part of Heber City, we're looking at doing away with all parking requirements in the downtown. Why? Because it's a killer and it's expensive in the downtown to have parking requirements. You might remember that on my priority list, one of our top priorities is surface parking. The city is going to absorb that as an economic incentive so businesses can focus on their overhead, their building, and not have to worry about buying additional space for parking. And that is a huge, huge win for businesses. I can tell you right now, we have lost several businesses, including a recent one that wanted to buy the Ideal Theater and load it with uh, kind of a game room, walked because they couldn't afford the parking requirements. So we're looking at doing away with those parking requirements. The city's looking at investing in wider sidewalks, mid-walk crossings, more amenities to attract people downtown, investments that have never been made on this scale before. The city's also hired Roger Brooks, a renowned uh, economists for downtowns who's helping us through this transition, even helping the businesses understand what they can do to be more successful to take advantage of these investments that are taking place. So from a business, what the city's doing now and the investments we're making has never been done before. And it's showing that the city is willing to put its foot where its mouth is and make this thing happen. But it's an area. It's a place where people can go. It's not just a strip mall. That's right. That's right. That's so right. I love it. Sorry. I just, I like it. So what is it that you want from the school? My ask is to say thank you for your time and simply to update you on my, uh, the, not my, the community's vision and, and hopefully maybe at a later point in time we can talk more about the interlocal agreement. Can you send us this presentation? You already got it. You got it? Perfect. Excellent. Any other questions for Matt? Do you have any insight on, <coughs> I you know last time we were together there were some question marks um, regarding a request from the city to get together and talk to us. Oh, yeah. Kim, do you know any details on that? I, you know, I think this takes the place of that. Oh, that takes the place of that. Because I know there's been some city council members trying to get in front of <clears> the <throat> school this, board members. This, uh, I, I think moving forward, um, you know, as we, if you recall, in our, in our last uh, board meeting, we talked about there, there was a couple of different options. One was for board members to, to meet more individually with, yeah. with city Matt and his folks and we decided to do it all together right here and take care of it in one meeting. Okay. And uh, this was this was not intended to be a you know a negotiation. This was for us to simply Education. see Matt's um, vision and that he's as he's stated it's not just his vision but it's the vision of of the city and so that, that's what we're here to okay. do tonight, yeah. is just to see what we're talking about and then moving forward we'll, we'll set up times to um, discuss that further and in more detail. Okay. What are the plans for um, around that, the western town area? Do you know? When you say western town area, what do you mean? Is that like the train station? By the high school? Yeah. Like so that, the, where Snake Creek Road used to be. What is that called? The old town. The old yeah. town. The old town. The old depot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. What about or by Amtec, by the high school? Would the boundary go that far west? Let's take a look. The old town area is. 
Because we're interested in that area. Because, yeah, what part is actually annexed, it would be, right. So this actually doesn't encompass oh, yes. your school site or the MTEC site. It does encompass the area, obviously, around uh, main, uh, Midway Lane and 6th West, approximately. What we're looking at primarily here is, is a couple things. And first of all, understand your investment in the area is about $150 million. Antex investment in the area, um, the Heberlight Powers investment in the area with the new admin building, and oh by the way, the county is looking at building an administration building in that area. You're going to see that's over 200 million dollars of public investment. You're going to see the private dollars follow. Heber City's interest is this: what we hope to do is to take 600 West between about Third South and Six South. That's that long roadway that kind of runs right next to the railroad itself. What we intend to do is work with the railroad to close that road down to through traffic. And they'll still be able to get through, but to close that down, hopefully move the railroad building from the west side to the east side, create a piazza in the area so you can have concerts and gathering places. Are you talking right here where these ballparks are? This area? You got a lot going on. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the one yeah. side of it is in it. Yeah. When you grab a part to the east side. So the train, like the train, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the train tracks, just because we just broke it. So you're wanting where the train runs, we always park on the other side, and that's where you get your tickets and everything. Yeah. You want to basically reverse that. So yeah. So and then turn that. So I, let me share with you an anecdote. So I mentioned Roger Brooks, who's the expert we hired. He went that area and walked it and researched it. And he says, Matt, first of all, I wasn't sure where the railroad was. And when I turned into the parking lot, I thought it was a public works area. I didn't realize it was actually the Heber Valley Railroad. And then when he learned that the railroad is the number one tourist destination in the county, and there's no retail or dining or hotels out there, he said, you guys are missing a gem of an opportunity. So Mark Nielsen, Dustin Graybaugh, and I have walked the area looking at opportunities. And what we're hoping to do is create that trail depot Remember, the rail trail is going to come right up the side of that trail and enter into this area. We're going to create that trail depot here. Hopefully move the existing train station to the east side. Create a plaza area. The ball fields aren't moving. They ain't going anywhere. They're staying where they are. So this becomes a sort of destination with the ball fields, with an expanded presence for the railroad. We're going to put some type of markers as you go into 3rd South on 6th West and on 6th South on 6th West. So you go underneath it, you know you've arrived. You're someplace special because of the indicators we have there. What we hope to do on Main Street and, and 6th West on that intersection, this now becomes a critical intersection. We are in conversations with two of the owners there to find out if they'd be willing to make investments that mirror the vision that we have there. And so we're hoping to influence them and the investments they make there. And of course, as I mentioned, I believe that private dollars are going to follow your investment. And I think you're going to see profound changes in this area. So is there any flexibility in the boundary? There is. There's a process we have to go through to amend that boundary area. Uh, but it's just a hurdle, not a barrier. And then... I have a question, I don't want to get too far ahead of the conversation that we'll have in the future. How much is your projected cost to do some of what you wanted to do with the renderings and your, your plan to execute it? What's the dollar amount? So I can tell you what the dollar amounts are for phase one of our transformation. I can tell you what the dollar amounts are for closing 200 south, the band shell, the, the water feature. We, we're looking at hiring Roger Brooks to come in and begin costing out these next steps. Specifically, a subject matter expert come in and tell us what those next costs are going to be. This, by the way, will not happen overnight. This is going to be phased in. And hopefully over time, you're going to see a lot of private interest in the downtown because of this vision. You hopefully see people begin coming downtown. And I, I believe, based on the developers that are coming to my office, that we are, on a, we are on a rocket ship that's on a launch pad ready to take off. With MIDA, with the Olympics, with the uh, bypass, these are game changers in terms of interest that's being drawn into our area. You look at the development that's taking place around the Jordan Hill Basin and that traffic coming into the downtown area, 
You look at the torus going into uh, Mayflower and trying to get them into the downtown. This is an opportunity that we will pinch ourselves if we don't take advantage of it. And so is the, is the CRA necessary to execute this plan? I believe it very much is. Yes. I mentioned Envision Central Heber as the blueprint. The CRA is the funding plan. Okay. And you showed kind of a list of other projects around, and other examples. You know, of, you know, yeah, that. Mm -hmm. So there are currently 173 active project areas, active project areas within the state of Utah. Some cities have more than one active project area in it, but there are currently 173 in the state of Utah. And how many of those involve the schools? Most of those would involve school districts, I imagine. I have a quick question, just not to get, this is my only question. The side streets of the CRA, so you can even use that one that you're just on. This one, yeah. Yeah. So what are happening to those side streets but right after the CRA, just out of curiosity? Give me an example. Just wondering, like, are, are those people going to be able to stay in their homes? Like, are they going to have a different tax base? Like, one side of the street is CRA, but the other side isn't? Like. If like they on the wanted, west side of 100 yeah. west and the east side of Like what happens east. there? Like what if they start a business, it's on the wrong side of the street? Or are you guys going to make exceptions with what's going on there? Just out of curiosity. Let's go back to the picture really quick. There you go, yeah. So. Like how did you decide that? So let, let, me, let me answer that by coming in kind of the back door here just for a moment. Understand that the property tax rate will not be any different for someone that's in the yellow okay. versus someone that's on the outside of the yellow. Okay. There'll be no difference. So residential or not, you're still in the same. Other than the homestead exemption that residential benefits from, <coughs> there'll be a difference between commercial and residential. Okay. Otherwise, the tax rates that you assess, the tax rates we assess, the tax rates the county assess, are generally equal through the area. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to mention that <clears throat> um, for the record, we're, we, uh, as, as we see the future moving forward and, and talk about investment in the community and, and it's becoming a, you know, a higher quality <clears throat> living experience for folks as, as compared to, um, you know, just this, this good management and, and having a vision for what we want to accomplish. Um, you know, we we believe, and I'm sure you agree, that um, the school district is, you know, any time you look at, at, a, at an area, uh, one of the first questions is, what's the education program look like? And um, we believe that, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, we don't believe, we, we know, um, we're, we, we've had an exciting announcement that we're about to kind of go public with, and, and that's the, of the 41 public school districts in the state of Utah, Wasatch County School District um, is the highest performing Congratulations. Um, in, in reading um, in our language arts program. We're, we're number one in Outstanding. The this, this past school year. We're number three in math, and we're, uh, we're number seven in science and, and moving in the right direction. And so when we talk, when we, when we, when we look at this mix, we want, we want folks to understand that the part of what drives all this and having the having the workforce and the, and the intelligent um, workforce that will, that will help move this forward is, is uh, things are, you know, we've got an outstanding school district and, and for a, a number of those kids now to be able to feed into um, MTech being right here, um, sharing a campus with us and, and continuing to do some things, um, I, I think will be a really big piece of, of the entire puzzle as we look at Wasatch County's future, and we we uh, we would we would hope that, uh, um, that, that that message can get out as much as as much as possible. That that uh, Wasatch County School District's doing their part, and, and uh, the, the level of education that is required here is 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 the best in the state. Yeah, I was expecting that to be one of your announcements. <laughs> <laughs> so, so am I wrong by seeing, I mean, maybe it's just me with my bias in the school district, 
the, the fact that our new location isn't a part of the CRA, you're, that, that, I have a question about that. So remember, this was established in 2020. Okay. And so that was, I can't believe it was four years ago. Now, I am, I'm, you know, the benefits of that is, I, I don't know, but you would think that, well, that's now an no, I think it's city. a good, I think it's a good point, Tom. If I can, if I can interject there, I, um, not, not so much as, um, you know, rather the school itself is in or out, it probably, it probably doesn't matter. But um, I, I think we, you know, I think we will be talking with, <coughs> with uh, the city in the, in the future about some things we'd like to see that, that, that maybe could, that could take place around the, around the school mm -hmm. and as we move forward. And, and that's not for today's discussion, but, but I think to Tom's point, we would like to, we would like to think that, that we can have some influence on, on what the neighborhood looks like around our school. Mm -hmm. And we've got some ideas. So we probably need to start talking sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Part of the Envision Central Hebrew Initiative was to define the types of uses and buildings that would be in and around, i.e. your school area. Right. Those decisions are being made right now. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the easy part is getting the vision. The hard part is getting the policies in place to bring about the vision. That's where the rubber meets the road. And those land use decisions are truly being made right now. Yeah, you know, I guess we're just postulating where the road's going to go, but that will have a big influence as well. Right? No question about it. What we do know is that bypass is going to go to the west side of you. We don't know exactly where, but it will go to the west side of you. We do know it's going to cross Midway Lane. We do know that there's going to be a couple roundabouts to Midway Lane. Um, so there's still a lot of variables, but it's starting to solidify little yeah. by little. Well, the timing's probably right then. Yeah. That we start these conversations because we do have a say on what the neighborhood around our new school is going to be. The last question that I have, and I know it's a loaded question, so I'm, but I'm going to preface it with that before I ask it, so you're ready for it. Is why wouldn't the city, if this is such a big initiative, why would they hinge on the CRA to make it happen? Why wouldn't they do a truth in taxation? Why wouldn't they do a building authority and figure out how to do other ways to finance, similar to what we did with the school? I mean, you're, you're talking to a group of elected officials that 1,000% put their neck on the line mm -hmm. to ensure that our vision came true, which is currently being built. No question. So. No question. I mean, I, I just scratch my head and say, why, why, why bank on the CRA? That may or may not happen if this is that important. So first, understand we are also considering other means of generating revenue, such as a parking authority, a DDA, a downtown development authority. So we're looking at those alternatives right now. We took a field trip into Colorado, went to Glenwood Springs, went to Boulder, went to Fort Collins, went to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And oh, by the way, Steamboat Springs, Colorado has a big roadway that runs through the middle of that. You know what roadway that is? Highway, Highway 40, <laughs> five lanes. And when we were there, their downtown was packed with tourist window shopping and dining. And it was a very vibrant and exciting atmosphere, even having a five lane roadway through the middle of this town. And so that is a community that you can pattern Heber after in terms of it becoming a destination. The CRA is the primary tool that the state legislature allows us to use to bring about tax increment or deploy tax increment for this type of benefit. If you go back to that list, I can probably verify this, the state legislature used to have a RDA law, or a, a, I forget the acronym, the, um, forgive me, the, it's an RDA law. RDAs are no longer allowed. What they've done is go to CRAs. They're pushing cities to use CRAs. And the CRA, in order to work, has to have the interlocal agreements with the tax generating entities. Yeah. And so one reason is state legislature. Second reason is because that's what most cities rely upon. And the thirdly is we are looking at a parking authority. We are looking at a DDNA. Ironically, Fort Collins and Boulder and Glenwood Springs all have DDNAs, but they're in Colorado and their state laws are different. So we're investigating that to see if something like that can be deployed here. And so, and I brought up the, the dollar now. 
are we talking 100 million, 200 million, a billion? Like, how much is it going to cost to execute your, your vision? We will know more once we get um, our consultant back in their contract and he begins to look at the cost. Understand, and this vision right here, let me come back down. Yeah. And this vision right here, the way we make this happen is through ordinance changes. In other words, as landowners come in, we have policies in place that gear them towards this type of development, that gear the protection of the pedestrian walkway, that ensures that we have architecture that is timeless and enduring. So that doesn't cost us anything. What that does is allow us to set the ground rules for the game that developers would have to play when they come in to develop. The cost that we speak of, of course, are the improvements on Highway 40. Again, you can see the landscape medians, the mid-block crossings, the wider sidewalks. What we're talking about is improvements in the pedestrian alley, closing down 200 South, the activization of Main Street Park 250 days a year. That's what we're looking at costing out. And quite frankly, that's hard to do right now. Look at your own building. Look at inflation. Look at other issues that are driving up cost. We had a citywide road maintenance project. In addition to the East Bypass, our costs are going up almost on a monthly basis. We're seeing inflation costs on infrastructure 20, 30 percent per year. Tell us about it. <laughs> so, in truth, the taxation is an option. It's just not one that you're looking at. It is not what we're looking at for this. And Heber City budget, their general fund budget. Uh, probably quite a bit unlike yours, our number one revenue source is sales tax. Probably almost three to one. Our, our property tax accounts for about two million of our overall general fund budget. The sales tax accounts for over six million of it. So it would have to be an incredibly large property tax increase. And so what we're thinking about with the CRA is that those that are in the CRA and making that investment into the tax increment would benefit from that tax increment investment. That's what's the beauty of this, is that those who are making that investment are getting the return on investment. All right. Great conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Congratulations no. on, on the... Uh, State uh, champs and re... Love it. <laughs> that, I will tell you, I've managed cities, East Coast, West Coast, and in between, and I've done a lot of economic development. And when you don't have the education, game over. When you don't have qualified students, qualified residents, game over. Economic development ain't going to happen. Yeah. So this is huge. Congratulations. Well, what they do is they break into your stores and they steal your items right out of your store. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Well, not in this you. county. It's not in this city. Thank you, yeah. Well educated. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. thanks. Thank Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we will push the uh, policy issues. Those policies are, I think, at least one of them, maybe both, are on the agenda. Yeah, so we we'll do the, We'll just that. do the information part before the before we vote. Okay. During the regular. Thanks, All right. Thank you. Thanks again, Matt. Yeah. We'll adjourn, and then we'll be back at six thirty.